I'm here today with Jack Lifton. We're going to have a quick conversation about the critical materials sector and where, where it is today. Jack, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Tracy. Jack, I'd like to start and kick this conversation off by discussing Eric Neurez's surprise departure from Linus. I mean, I was surprised. Uh, I, I was very surprised. And in, in some emails with him and uh, some emails I saw from Linus and the press releases, I got the impression that their position is that Eric had finished his task, which was to set up the lamp and bring it into operation. And now he's done and uh, taking a well-deserved uh, retirement or something, but he's only like 54 years old. Uh, his position is that he left the company with no no reason given, and that he is moving back to France, his, his native country. So um, I am a bit uh, confused here because Eric has tremendous experience in Asia, Southeast Asia, with, uh, first with Linus, I mean, Linus most recently, and then prior to that, he had a distinguished career. He was the manager of Bordes Rare Earth Unit out there, and prior to that, he was a, a, a manager and a chemical engineer at, I think, Shell or one of those large companies. So he's, I've always thought, having met him and having uh, asked him to speak at some conferences I monitored over the years, that he was one of the best informed and most experienced men in the space. So I am totally perplexed as to why he's being replaced by, excuse the expression, bean counter. Uh, usually you put a bean counter in when all the technical problems are solved. This I don't, I don't see Linus as having solved all their technical problems. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why Eric left, and I can't speculate, but I just don't think it's a good thing for Linus. We'll revi we will revisit this again in the future, but I can tell you one thing. I happen to love Eric. I thought he was incredibly articulate and a sophisticated leader and manager. I had a lot of respect, and I've got a lot of time for him. But I must confess, after having been in this industry for a number of years with zero female CEOs. You may call her a bean <laughs> counter, but hurrah, we finally have a female CEO. So I could not be happier. So we're going to move now from uh, finally a woman potentially saving the day. You know I'm cheering for this plot line. Um, to yes. Tesla. Tesla's all over the news. The gigafactories, yep. the electric cars. I think I wrote uh, just this week about how many of my graphite companies were lifting 10, 15, 25, and heck, we had an African graphite company lift nearly 200%, Triton Minerals. Yep. Jack, electric cars, China, the vision. Uh, you're the one that keeps reminding everybody that the world is larger than just North America. Would yes. you like to yes. comment on this? Yeah, yes. It, actually, uh, let's say that uh, I, I'm surprised, but Tesla has raised three and a half or more billion of the five billion they need for their gigafactory. As of this morning, they're down to the Reno and Texas areas as the possible sites for this. And, and I was intrigued, I think, by the Wall Street Journal, couldn't figure out what Reno was so attractive about. Apparently, they're not aware of the fact that one of America's only uh, lithium brine sources is in northern Nevada, actually not far from Reno. Now, why do I say that? Because Tesla has indicated to many of people in the, in the critical metal space, some of whom are my clients, that they are looking to, to do a total supply chain on lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, things that they're going to use for their cars. And, and I want to say right off the bat that to the best of my knowledge, the use of rare earths in the Tesla is trivial. It's not important. They might use them in seat motors or something, but they're not part of the drivetrain. However, lithium cobalt batteries, lithium phosphate, lithium vanadium, and graphite certainly are a, a big part of Tesla's future. In fact, if Tesla were to build this factory, and produce the number of cars it's, tar it's targeting. It would then be using, I think, I made a, a back of the envelope calculation, about 25% of the world's uh, lithium resources and a good percentage of the graphite, which since, since these is new use, it means it would, it would drive new mining and refining. And if Tesla is interested 
in, in the total supply chain, which means they could build refining operations and fabricating operations, that certainly would be a driver for the best of the graphite and lithium uh, juniors at the moment. Well, just, uh, you know, we mentioned Eric Neuraiz at the beginning of this conversation, so I'm going to immediately flip to Mark Smith, the former CEO <laughs> of uh, yep. Molycore, is now uh, heading up Niocore, which is a niobium play, which apparently mm -hmm. is also used in electric cars, yep. and uh, their stock is moving aggressively as well. Do you have any comments on niobium? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. People don't pay. I, you would think that the, the rare earth overview had triggered some deep thinking uh, by analysts, but apparently it hasn't. Uh, in fact, the niobium uh, dominant dominatrix of the world is the is Brazil. So uh, I congratulate Mr. Smith and his company because we now will have an alternative, at least one. There, there's always been talk of niobium mining in Canada, but it never seems to 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 do a whole lot. So I, I, I think with an, an extremely aggressive CEO like Smith and a very good deposit like the one out there he's got, uh, they have a very good shot. And if I were a big user of niobium, I would certainly select them as my alternate. At the moment, the supplier is Brazil. I would select them as an alternate uh, just to have some security and uh, in, in the case of a company like Tesla, domestic content. Well, I'm kind of embarrassed. I should have started this conversation by congratulating you on your most oh. recent contract you you uh, you just announced. Tell our our audience what TMR uh, uh, just recently put out in a news release this last week. Uh, TMR ha has gotten a subcontract from the Army Research Laboratory, which is the division of the uh, Department of U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, the principal contractor is Worcester Polytechnical Institute in, in uh, out east. And uh, what our contract is, is to review the, the uh, processing technologies for separating the rare earths with the idea, with the view, as the, the English might say, of determining if any of the uh, processes being put forward that will speed this up, accelerate uh, the, the time reduce the time it takes to uh, produce the separate wares and increase the efficiency if any of those processes have merit. So the, the way to do that is, is we have selected a several very promising looking technologies and they will be funded through this contract uh, to do some uh, beta site testing and there may be an extension on this uh, to go forward with that. The ultimate idea one day is to build a pilot plant with the best, most efficient, highest speed separation technology possible. So this is basically, uh, they're asking us to review what's out there. And you know there's a lot of stories out there about everybody's got a secret sauce or secret technology. Well, we're taking a pretty hard look at this and We've made some selections and we're going forward. And this is, of course, a public contract, but the results won't be public for six months. And then each six months we'll be publishing something. Well, I'm going to be doing an, uh, an interview here with Era Fura either later today or tomorrow because I can't get over the dis discrepancy between their share price and just even how much cash they have in the bank. Um, so I just want to segue into UCOR Rare Metals. It seems to me with all of their news announcements, with all the <clears throat> issues of sustainability, that their stock should also be, you know, definitely prospering right now. Can you tell me a little bit about what you know that's happening with UCOR and uh, bring our well, audience up to speed? Actually, I, I don't want to be mysterious, but I have very high hopes for UCOR. They're, they're quite frankly uh, doing very well in their development, very well. Now, I, I'm, I'm constrained by, by documents from saying any more than that. Let, let's put it okay. this way. So it's a sleeper. 
let's just say that it's one of those stocks that you personally, one of the stories that you have high hopes for. I think there's no challenges yes. with securities with you saying that. And speaking okay. of securities, I'm looking forward to finding out why Alkane's trading was halted today. And uh, then I did want to also bring up with you what happened with Northern Minerals. Um, I, to me, it's a very good sign that they've currently concluded that their existing offer uh, with the Conglin Industries is uh, something that they'd like to maybe redirect. Or what's your conclusion with this? Uh, my, con my conclusion is they're feeling very confident. First of all, they've got a, a really excellent deposit, to say the least. They, they, they've got a very good management team. And uh, let's say that their pro everyone in, in the space has the exact same problem. What do we do with the kind? We've got to get this stuff separated and farther downstream. But it's much easier when you have an, you know, e either a high-grade mineral or a very well-known mineral with very well-known chemistry. They, they actually have both. And, and so uh, what I think here is that um, – they're no longer a cheap date or a pushover. I think they're saying to this extremely powerful investor, you know what, uh, we're, we're, it's no longer the gorilla and the mouse, it's two gorillas at the table. And, and I, think that, I think that's exactly what's happening. And I suspect that the large investor will come back and compromise. I think the uh, the news with Northern Minerals is a very positive sign for the overall yes. market. And I just want to make a final note here. I'm sure our uh, mutual friend uh, and uh, one of Investor Intel's uh, guest columnist, Chris Ecclestone, was just uh, appointed CEO for Geodex, which is an all-antimony uh, project. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on antimony before we leave? Yeah, well, I know Chris has been working on that project for some time. And antimony Antimony is a sleeper technology metal. Once again, guess who you know is dominating that space? And and I'll I'll tell you what's interesting about it. People say, well, what's that for? And they say, well, low temperature solder or something. So what? There's antimony, folks, in every battery in every car. There's a whole lot of those. And, and so uh, as uh, as you know, who over the Pacific is ramping up to produce maybe as much as one third to one half of the world's cars by the end of this decade. So they, they'll be eating, they're, they're the big antimony supplier right now. They're gonna be eating their own children and we're gonna be left with nothing on the table. If we don't get some antimony produced here and in Europe, we're screwed. By the way, keep in mind that antimony was an original part of bronze, which was Britain's gift to warfare in, in Europe of, of our ancestry, or at least of our intellectual ancestry. Okay. Well, again, congratulations on your news, uh, Jack, and of course to Gareth Hatch, Chris Ecclestone, yes. um, all of our clients that have all had a very uh, positive impact from the uh, Tesla Gigafactory news. And uh, Jack, have a great week. Thank you.